So I've been going on multi-day bike trips for about five years now, you know, overnight adventures. And I've learned a number of things and I thought I would kind of share them in this video. And the number one is if you're watching this channel, you're probably going on your bike tour because it's your vacation. So you should do it the way you want to do it. I think there's a strange thing in the whole outdoor space, um, whether it's camping or bikepacking or whatever, or just traveling and hiking, where it's like, People think there's an award for roughing it the most, and there's not. If you want to do what we call a credit card tour and stay in hotels or Airbnbs or even rustic cabins, do it the way you want to do it. Um, like I said, there's no prize for the other way. You should enjoy your vacation. Like when someone goes on a beach vacation, no one ever says, well, if you love the beach so much, why don't you sleep on it? So that's my first point. Do, do, your, do you um, have a good time on your trip? And if, you know... The hotel is more comfortable. That's great. Which leads me to my second thing. Um, I like sleeping in a bed, but we do camp a lot on our tours. And I find that there's three reasons to do it. Um, the first one for me is cost. Even if you spend a lot of money on the nicer gear, which I'll get into in a minute, your, whether it's your tent or your sleeping system, sleeping bags and all that, and they're the lightweight stuff. If you do a number of tours over a few years, I think your stuff is going to easily pay for itself. So, you know, state campgrounds, national park campgrounds. Uh, we use hip camp a lot, which is great if, in case you are looking for a spot that's not necessarily on a typical, you know, bike tour, bike packing route that works well. Those are just always going to be much cheaper than hotels and a bunch of Airbnbs night after night. So to me, that's one of the reasons to sleep on the ground. Uh, the second would be flexibility. I have a friend traveling through who follows the channel. He rode all the way across the country last summer with no real hard plans on where he was going to be at the end of every single day. And having your sleeping gear with you when you're doing that makes that possible. Whether, you know, he did a lot of stealth camping, but, you know, we just did the CNO and the gap trail and with the pull off spots, you know, you get to the mileage you want for the day. You could stop wherever if you have everything you need to sleep with. And I would say the third reason is uh, getting to different locations. Uh, you know, if you're doing true bike packing out west and say you're on a mountain or in the deep woods, you know, you're going to need your sleeping stuff with you. Chances are there's not going to be a comfort in on the top of the mountain. You know, in our case, sometimes it's just like even when we were camping outside of Cumberland, we just had a cool spot on the river with our fire pit. We could see the town and the fireworks because it was 4th of July in the distance. That made sense to me to camp there just for the location. Like people are always surprised when I'm like, I don't really like sleeping in a tent that much, but the reason I do it is those three reasons right there, which also leads me into the whole like sleep system thing. I keep saying the word tent because that's what I prefer. I like it in case, you know, there's rain. And so I'm comparing it to say like a bivy sack or like the hammock thing. I like the ability to be able to sit up, you know, say you get up in the morning and it's raining and the rain might be ending soon. For me, it's somewhere to sit. It's a nice place to be able to change and stuff like that. So for the size, packability size advantage you get from the other systems, I still prefer the tent. Also, for some reason for years, I didn't sleep with any kind of sleeping mat or pad. Um, I just slept on my sleeping bag on the ground. I thought it didn't matter and I might as well save the space. Erin, who I, you know, I'm usually camping with, you know, she gets up early in the morning and she had the inflatable one and I would roll over on that and I'd be like, oh my God. So finally, I learned, <laughs> get yourself a good sleeping mat. I prefer the inflatable ones. I've never used those fold-up ones that don't inflate that I see. But the reason from everything I've read and just from... The way it seems to me, uh, I've read that, you know, the inflatable ones are more comfortable. Um, they're better for temperature regulation and they pack up much smaller. If you use those other foldable ones, let me know what the advantages of them are because besides the fact that they can't get pricked and deflate, I don't really see what the advantage of those would be for bikepacking. So let me know if I'm off base on any of that stuff. I also learned this year um, for the first time on our last tour that I much prefer a quilt to a sleeping bag. I have a pretty nice sleeping bag and I've always used it and I'll continue to use it if the weather is going to be a little more on the chilly side, but I'm someone who will sleep on my side and toss and turn. And so I was much more comfortable with a quilt and also temperature regulation. I could you know, kind of pull it off myself a lot easier than a sleeping bag. I move my feet around. So one thing that I learned is, you know, if you're uncomfortable in your sleeping bag, check out the quilt options. I know they have like super cold weather options too, that'll actually work with your sleeping pad and clip in and all that. Mine's just kind of a blanket and I use my sleeping bag liner, which folds up tiny underneath it. Super spendy. And mine was ducked down and it's got waterproofness to it and all that kind of stuff. But to me, again, like one of those things that's going to be worthwhile make my nights of sleep better after, you know, 
60, 70, 80 miles out on the trail, I think it's worth it. Another thing with the sleep system when it comes to the pillows, I have one I really like and they have some that I always use the inflatable ones again because of the space saving in the bags, but some kind of have a little bit of a thick like uh, cover or I guess thin cover that gives them a little more comfort to feel like your normal pillow at home. The one that I've been using for years actually deflated on this trip and I bought a new one from an outdoor store and that was a much bigger pillow, which was nice, but it had no kind of cover on it. It was just like, you know, and more like sleeping on like something that you would use like in a pool, like an inflatable, you know, raft or something where, so I like to look for, and I think I'm going to end up replacing it and get one again that has like some kind of cover or softness to it. I'll be showing that in the background now because I don't really know how to explain that as well. There's a couple things that I found that makes sleeping a little more comfortable because like I said, a bed is always king. Um, and that's the thing we do sometimes too. We, if we're going to be gone for like five days, uh, we might mix in like one Airbnb on the trip because just getting in a comfortable shower is nice. On this last trip, we had one Airbnb and it was really great. There was even a washing machine. So after we had 100 degree days, so to be able to wash a couple of your uh, clothing items or sleeping items. So yeah, that like for the, you know, sleeping gear, like... I think it's really worth spending the money on the good stuff, the reputable brands and all that. The reason being that you're paying for like the lightweight, high tech materials, and it's just worth it to have those on the road. Also, you know, if you really cheap out and you know, your stuff just breaks, are you really saving any money if you have to buy something over and over again? So I do think the expensive stuff is worth it when it comes to this. And like I had alluded to earlier, if you're using it a lot, it is going to pay for itself. So you know, I have a Nemo Hornet two-person tent. Uh, mine's a backpacking tent. Uh, Pudgy Pedal Pusher, another channel member. I got to see when we camped one night earlier this year. He had the new bike packing version. So looking to see if they're, you know, the bike packing versions of stuff. The one benefit of that, or one of the benefits, is the tent poles fold up much smaller. Um, I ride big bikes, so I could actually fit my poles on the bike. But if you don't, that could be an issue. It just gives you more flexibility in packing your tent up. Also, his version had a lot more um, structure to it. Mine relies on a lot of staking it out. So it's worth thinking about if you're going to be tent camping somewhere where it's hard to stake. My tent is not very good um, for that kind of thing. We stayed on some kind of gravelly stuff one night this year, and it was really hard to get my tent to be set up. But yeah, same with the sleeping bags. The reason they're the good ones are expensive is because they pack up really small. They're really warm. Uh, they're high quality, same kind of thing. So I don't believe in trying to cheap out on your sleep system. Again, it's your vacation. If you're going to spend it in a tent, you're going to want to get the best night's sleep you can. When it comes to the other gear stuff, you can do this on pretty much any bike. If it's more traditional touring, to me, the key is just to make sure that your bike is going to be comfortable and that your bike isn't going to have a lot of problems. I've toured on really cheap bikes, a 1980s, early 80s Roger Riviere that I turned into a touring bike. I had it all simple, you know, friction shifting and all that. So no real problems and wheels that were decent. So you can go touring on anything. If you're going out west, true bike packing trips and doing really gnarly trails, that's where the more expensive bike and, you know, that kind of stuff might come into play. But for touring, that's really up to you. And if you're not someone who's trying to go lightning fast, if you're not racing this stuff, you know, you don't need the latest carbon fiber thing to have a good time out on your bike. My last tour was on a 90s mountain bike. I used to use a Trek 500, the old ones from 1982. One of the things with that that I learned though over a couple years of riding that one, I love the way the bike looked. I love the way I had it set up and it's still a great road bike that I ride. It wasn't comfortable loaded down. I had to put most of, the, most of the weight on the back of it the way it's set up. The chain stays aren't very long, and I could barely take my hands off the bars. It was so, like, squirrely on the front end. So you really, you know, I, I held on to that concept for too long because I just really liked the bike, but it really wasn't a comfortable touring bike. So the other thing is whatever you intend to use, you should also do, like, a good shakedown ride, like maybe a short overnighter with it. That's kind of what I always try to do now before our big trip is, like, the weekend before or whenever I have time. Get it loaded up, do an overnighter so I know how it's going to feel, how it's going to handle, how it's going to pack. You will feel way different on your bike loaded than you do when it's empty. You'll find your pressure points are different and all kinds of stuff like that. I've had situations where my hands have been going numb during the day because of the way the bike handles. This year, I just had to make some minor saddle adjustments. You know, I ride Brooks B-17s, but so it's definitely whatever you're going to ride, try and find out if it's going to be comfortable and then, you know, make sure that it's 
you know, you got it like maintained and that you can do minor repairs on the road. And that especially is more important depending on how far you'll ever be from civilization or any bike shops, but bring the spare inner tube, know how to change your tire, a chain tool. I've broken a chain on tour. You know, you're pushing more weight. My chain snapped and I had to take a couple links out until I got to a bike shop. You don't need the latest and greatest, but you do need something that's going to be comfortable and get the job done. A couple more things when it comes to packing your bike, I find it's better to underpack than to overpack. When I went on my first uh, multi, like I think week long bike tour, I brought a pair of jeans because we were going to be in Cincinnati and we were going to have a night there before we drove back. And I thought like, well, I'm going to want to put on jeans and look like a little more normal. What a waste of weight and space that is, you know what I mean? And then, you know, another thing with that is like looking at smart wool or some better like materials to wear some stuff that you might be able to wear a couple days in a row, which wool gives you. I tend to overpack still on socks. I hate having wet feet. That's like a personal thing. People just tend to fill every space that they have. I feel like trying to go as minimal as possible is only going to make you happier when you're out there. You're going to be going through towns. If you forgot your toothbrush, there's going to be a place to buy a toothbrush. We tend to eat out a lot when we're on the road. That's, you know, again, it's vacation. We like to go to breweries and restaurants, but I always do carry a couple camp meals in case the timing gets off or we get in late. You know, we travel on 4th of July. So this year, you know, we stopped and made camp meals for lunch because there was going to be anything open in the small towns we were really going through. And then snacks, I think, are hugely important. Even if you're going to be eating out, you need to have some kind of food on your bike, whether you like the sports science stuff, which I don't, you know, bars and gels and all that kind of stuff. I like to have some candy, some peanuts. I like figs. But there's nothing worse than bonking. If you've never bonked, it's like the worst feeling in the world. It's when you get too low on sugar. I've literally been riding down a trail, like in the hardest gear, top speed and didn't eat enough. And man, it could go to mentally, you could go to the worst places, but also physically you could all of a sudden, it'll be like, you could barely turn the pedals. It's like the lights go out. So just keeping some snacks always on you. I've gotten better at that. And now I stay ahead. You know, I've learned over time where my mileage for a loaded bike is going to, where I'm going to need food. So, you know, I always know, like, eat before you're hungry, stuff like that. It's kind of something you have to learn from experience, but just make sure you have the food there. Because even if you do bonk, at least you could sit down and have the snack and not have to find something and really drag yourself um, over the coals to get there because it can be rough. When it comes to routing on a trip, I found that I am so glad I have a bike computer now. Not necessary. You can do the stuff with your phone too, but I really like having a bike computer. Made whole videos about it, but I just love having the routing from a bike computer. Uh, this last trip, you know, we were just following a bike trail almost the entire way. You know, we had some routes saved for when we had to get to a couple Airbnbs or our camp, one Airbnb, but our campgrounds that weren't on the trail. Having the routes loaded ahead of time for that is great, but I really do love having the bike computer. Also, when it comes to the routing and mileage, everyone's going to travel different. You know, there's going to be people who want to go out there and hammer their miles, but I think no matter what, build in extra time to your day more than you need. Even if you are someone who's going to hammer, like, mechanicals happen, like we were saying, you know, you could get that flat tire, you could break a chain, you could need to do something. So build in some time for that detour route we just did. There was a detour that I didn't know existed. So extra time there. But you know, if you're someone who's really going to, you know, smell the roses, like you might come upon something that you didn't know you wanted to see or just building in time for, yeah, sightseeing and all that. So I wouldn't like calculate the mileage based on how fast you think you're going to ride, but extra time for the detours, enjoying yourself. We rode into one small town that was having a festival and we found a brewery and it's like, you know, stayed for one more beer than we would have. So it's just great to build some extra time and uh, allowances into your day for that. And if you're going to be traveling with a group, it's good to have a good idea of what people's individual plans are. Because again, you don't want to go out with the guy who just wants to hammer all day long. And his only goal is to get to the campground, get up early, get to the next campground and go to bed. Like you want to make sure if that's not what you want to do, you're with a group of people that, you know, similar mentality, you know, cause I'm always the one who wants to read all the historical markers and stuff like that and stop and check stuff out. And then, you know, I could even say to my friends now, go ahead, I'll catch back up. But 
it's worth, you know, some of that stuff you won't know ahead of time, um, but it's worth at least trying to look into it if you're going to travel with other people to at least have a conversation about what everybody's trying to do to get on the same page. So those are just like a couple simple things that I was thinking of um, when we were on the last tour of like what I've changed or what I think about now since I started doing it when I had my tent sticking out of a commuter pannier on my first time going overnight and not having a sleeping mat and all that kind of stuff. Um, getting lost on the route once. So a couple things that have come to mind to me that make the experience a little better. Um, I know there's a bunch of other things. If anyone has advice, like drop those below. Um, also check out my little store below if you want to support the channel, become a channel member. We have some really cool gear and stuff like that, some cool designs that my buddy Micah has made. So that's it for this one, and I will see you later.